from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And here's what's coming up. K-State's Glenn Tonzer. On this week's cattle market segment, he'll preview the USDA's cattle inventory report to be issued this Friday. Glenn goes over the latest numbers on domestic and export meat demand, what those mean to the cattle sector going forward. Also today, K-State's Keith Harmony will take a look at several grazing management rules of thumb and whether or not they're actually valid, a couple of them having to do with stocking rates, another addressing what is and isn't a weed in a pasture grazing sense. And on this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Aliyah Mestrovich C. shares more with Jeff Wickman about the new 4-H Community Conversations program. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Glad to have you along once again. For our weekly cattle market segment, we've invited by once more livestock economist Glenn Tonzer of K-State Research and Extension. Of course, we have a USDA cattle on feed report to dissect with Glenn. Also, a glance ahead to that cattle inventory report coming out later this week. The week we're coming off of, though, Glenn, as far as the trade goes, the board was a little bit on the weaker side, and the cash trade was rather steady, you say? Yeah, on balance, it was a fairly calm week. I suspect this coming week might be a little more active, and we'll talk about that as we go. But uh, let's take the cash trade first. Uh, the five market fed cattle price came in at about 124 and a quarter, basically flat from the prior week. Feeders, AMS, called flat or steady, uh, up two or three bucks, depending on what market you would quote. A couple of Kansas lots, 400 head at 720 pounds, traded at 146 and three quarters. And then another larger lot, uh, 444 head and weighing 844, traded at 142. Those both would be up just a little bit from the week before. And then just ran off the cash market. Cut out choice was at 214 and a half, and select was at you know, 210 70. 210 and 70 cents that is uh both of those are up a little bit for the week so there's a fairly you know flat good story on the cash side to round this out for the board fed cattle the nearby february contract was off about a dollar for the week the april contract which a lot of people have hedged against and placed cattle against is 124.30 down about two bucks for the week we flip over to feeders to round this out the january contract was just under 142 down almost three dollars for the week and then the uh, I took note of the September contract, just for those that are looking for the upcoming calf crop price. It's traded at, or ended the week at 152, down about three and a half bucks. So there is kind of a mixed bag in that story. Uh, fed cattle were flat or down a little bit on the board. Feeders were up on the cash and then down on the board. Some of that stuff might shake itself out a little bit more this coming week. Before we dive into the reports, most of our listeners know there's growing angst on multiple global issues, um, human health issues on the coronavirus and so forth in China. You got to pause and say, what's that mean for the cattle market? Well, what does it mean? There's a general concern that that human health issue will develop into a slowdown in the Chinese economy, among other things. To the extent that happens, it could pull down the global economy, and that's obviously bad for beef demand. Moreover, to the extent it pulls down the Chinese economy, some of the optimism and bullishness about exporting lots and lots of meat into China in response to their other health concern, ASF, could be tempered. You're still going to have a protein shortage, but in the event the Chinese economy goes weaker than we anticipate, their ability to pay up for protein will be hampered as well. So that comes into play, for example, when I talk about cold storage numbers in a minute, about the global ability to move meat into China. So it's an economist's job to say all these things are connected. Hopefully that was fairly clear uh, to our listeners, but a human health issue in China is relevant for U.S. cattle markets. Now, the macroeconomics of it are, are always played out over time, so that's important to stress, but you just want producers to be aware of the potential here. Very much so. And to that point, you know, if the fundamentals otherwise don't change, I won't be surprised if we have a pullback early this week due to the potential downside of that development. 
to the USDA reports and the one that we know of now, the cattle on feed report issued last Friday. One of the things that traders were keenly interested in here going in was the percentage of heifers placed in feedlots. Glenn, and you might pass along the numbers to us. Yeah, so let me let me summarize the whole report here first. Is uh, the kettle on feed report January inventory was up two percent, marketing's up five percent, and placements were up about three percent. I took note here; these were in line with pre-report estimates. So you know, there's a range; those all fit right within those. And basically, there was no big surprises in that story. And I would say, along with the heifers, is the same. This report, in many ways, is in lockstep with everything else, leads us into the cattle inventory report, which is upcoming this coming Friday. Uh, that'll be another one of those, is the herd expander or not kind of barometers. There's a growing sentiment around analysts, just to use that term generally in the industry, that we have stopped herd expansion. You know, Most people know, I've kind of said for a couple of years, we're sort of plateauing. We're not changing the total a lot. The notable pullback in calf prices that occurred earlier this year, third quarter and so forth, put some producers to be less optimistic about profitability than they were before, may have been the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, for somebody that was thinking about expanding that's not going to. So that report, coupled with what I anticipate will come up in the cattle inventory report, is probably going to lead us, and again, we'll know next week after this report's out, to sort of confirm that we are going to start shrinking the herd. Now, I don't think we're going to shrink it fast, but that might be the numbers that say we are going to start shrinking the breeding herd and therefore the calf crop thereafter. But by and large, the cattle on feed report itself was rather benign because it was right in line with expectation. Yeah, I would not consider it a market mover in any ways. What is important to note uh, a couple days before, and sometimes we don't spend as much attention to this, but the cold storage report came out on Wednesday, and there is a lot of meat in the freezers, but it's not beef. This is the punchline summary here. Beef stocks are up 1% from the prior month, but they're down 3% from from the prior year. Pork's up 1% from the prior month, but up a full 15% from the prior year. And then chicken's down 2% from last month and up 9% from the prior year. So to recap that, the pork and chicken stocks are up notably from the year before. There is a lot of discussion. Are those stock numbers up just because it's a holding place as we try to move those products towards China? I do think there's some truth to that. And this is also why I made the comment about the coronavirus. These things are related. The interest and ability for China to import those pounds is going to be related to their economic status not just today, but over the upcoming months. So the cold storage report, I would encourage us always to watch it, but it's particularly important given the amount of meat we have being produced here in the U.S. currently. And the particular expectations, Glenn, on the cattle inventory report, your colleagues at the Livestock Marketing Information Center have come out with numbers. They have, and the beef cow number, they've put at a drop of 0.8%, so a little bit less than 1% pullback. Uh, Heifers held back for replacement. They're estimated about 3.5% lower than the year before. And then the calf crop being about half a percent lower. I don't have any real reason to argue with any of those. I do know there's several analysts that think the beef cow number might pull back more than that. You know, some are calling for 1.2, 1.3% declines. Those might sound like small differences, but for as big as our herd is, there is an important difference on whether this becomes a minus 0.8 or a minus 1.2. Regardless, I anticipate, much like LMIC, that all three of those numbers will be negative, as shared there, that will confirm that we are done expanding. We're going to start shrinking the herd, uh, as we've said multiple times in the recent past. That semi-annual USDA cattle inventory report coming out this Friday, the 31st of January. Now, a couple of other things. You do have your latest meat demand indices calculated for domestic and export meat demand, not just beef, but the other major meats as well. What are you finding there of interest, Glenn? Yeah, so on the domestic front, the good news for beef continues. So November, and remember there's a lag on the data availability, uh, the November values were up 3% compared to November of 2018. That makes eight out of 11 months in 2019 are positive for domestic beef demand. That is very good, and we all need to appreciate where that's coming from. Uh, pork was down 2% in November, and chicken was down half a percent in November. Flip it over to the export side. Beef continues its challenge as it relates to export demand. It was down 10% in November. That basically means we have a mixed bag. So five of the 11 months in 2019 were positive. For a quick pause here, 2018 was a really good year for beef export demand. So part of the reason for these numbers being down year over year is it being compared to high value in 2018. Uh, November of 19, the pork export demand index was up 35%. 
And yes, that is not a typo. You know, I redid the numbers three or four times. Mm-hmm. That is a very large number. It's actually the sixth month in a row in 2019, so through November, that we had over a 10% gain year over year in pork export demand. That, in many ways, is your China ASF, Southeast Asia, more generally ASF development that continues to go on. Uh, the broiler export demand index was up 5% in November. Uh, that makes four out of 11. So to put a bow on all of that, year over year gains are stronger domestically than abroad when it comes to U.S. beef. And sort of the opposite is true for pork. Monitoring all that is always going to be important. This reason I walk us through the cold storage report. We have a lot of meat in the system, particularly pork production and the amount just kind of sitting waiting to find a home. And I hope those export demand values continue to grow for pork because that will help us find a home for lots of those pounds. For our cattle listeners, if they don't, that will become bearish because more of those pork pounds have to stay here domestically. And that will put some cross price pressure on the beef. And lastly, you have put together the latest return projections on feedlot cattle, and we've been anticipating that story to improve as we move forward, and indeed the numbers show that. Very much so. So, you know, backward looking real quick, the November closeouts were break even, plus two bucks for steers. Uh, December closeouts are estimates, because I don't have the final production data in, uh, were $51 to the positive. And we look here to the first quarter of 2020, averaging across those three months is about $100 per month positive return is projected. And then looking further out to the second and third quarters here of 2019, those are break even to positive projections, depending on the exact month. Two Statistics to keep in mind in general across those months is uh, the cost of gain. It varies month to month, but in general, it's projected to be 85 to $90. Uh, the upcoming corn market and weather conditions and so forth can definitely have an impact on that, particularly on the back end of these projections. And meanwhile, the output sales price, so break-even fed cattle cash price, that's necessary to break even is 120 to 125 in these numbers. And if you look at the board now on the historical basis, that's consistent with you could lock in a margin and sometimes a decent margin if you're interested. That's a quite different tone than, you know, let's say four months ago. Uh, we we're sitting here in August, September, October. The tone of those immediate uh, closeouts were quite negative. We have turned the corner there. A lot of the positive optimism that was embedded in the April Fed cattle contract is embedded in these numbers that is shared. Good to see the potential for black ink in cattle feeding at long last. So looking forward to 2020 in that respect. And Glenn's information as covered today and much more is posted regularly on the agmanager.info website. Be sure to keep tabs on all of that, agmanager.info. Glenn, a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Eric. Livestock economist Glenn Tonzer, K-State Research and Extension, with this week's cattle market insight and comment on agriculture today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, information out of the K-State Agricultural Research Center at Hayes and shared with us by the rangeland scientist who has been based at that center for quite a few years now, Keith Harmony. We asked Keith to join us today because he's put out an article and we'll follow up with similar articles in the future about the rules of thumb for cattle grazing management. Want to get into these and talk of if they have any validity or not. And we'll start with one that we've heard many a time about how heavily one should graze a pasture. And the phrase is take half and leave half. You might outline what is meant by that, Keith. Yeah, well, what I've done in that in that article is I've taken these rules of thumb and then I've stated whether or not I thought that these were acceptable rules of thumb to abide by in management. And so I gave each of these phrases or rules of thumb either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. (laughs) Appropriately. (laughs) Yes. And, And this first one that you're talking about, the take half and leave half, I gave that a thumbs up. And this is probably the the most common and and important rule of thumb for managers to to abide by on pastures. And basically what this uh, take half and leave half rule of thumb entails is that half of the forage produced by a pasture 
during a growing season can be removed and that pasture can be be sustainable over time by removing half of that forage. If more than half of that forage is removed, then that's probably going to be an unsustainable practice and the pasture will, over time, become less productive. When we say take half and leave half, the half that's removed or disappears throughout the growing season, 50% of that half or one quarter of the total forage produced by the pasture in a growing season is actually the amount of forage that is consumed or ingested by the grazing animal. So 25% of that ends up being used by the animal for their growth and production during the year. The other 25% of the total produced is forage that disappears due to trampling, due to wildlife use and insect use, and also due to just uh, senescence off the plant and natural weathering. It's not consumed by the animal. It, it is not consumed by the animal, but it does disappear from other sources, such as wildlife, insects, and, and natural senescence. So 25% is removed by the animal, and 25% is removed from these other sources. The 50% that remains is very important because that 50%, the forage remaining with green growing leaf material that's able to photosynthesize and to produce um, carbohydrates for that plant to produce more leaves and for that plant to also produce carbohydrates that it will use to produce more roots and to help that root system to grow. Another portion of the carbohydrates that are produced from photosynthesis are used for storage. Those storage carbohydrates are needed for that plant to regrow in case it gets grazed again, but it's also important for that plant to have carbohydrates in storage so that it can overwinter, it can survive that winter period, and it will have energy to start growing again the next spring. So the 50% that remains on pasture is very important for that plant to produce more leaf material and also for it to produce storage carbohydrates and roots so that it can persist and grow the next season. So again, that's why that gets an emphatic thumbs up. That is the principle of taking half and leaving half. There's another phrase that you often hear that one can't overgraze and make money. And how does that rate? Well, I I gave that rule of thumb a thumbs up as well. And it's been shown that pastures that are overgrazed or overutilized tend to have lower net returns than pastures that are grazed at a moderate rate, which is basically using the take half and leave half concept. Pastures are going to have their greatest net returns where animal production is most efficient on an individual basis, as well as most efficient on a beef production per acre basis. So what I mean by that is that at a moderate stocking rate, we basically have the most animals possible out on a pasture gaining to their highest individual performance potential. And as we increase the number of animals on pasture beyond that moderate rate, pasture production increases because we're adding more animals, but it increases at a decreasing rate because with each additional animal, they're achieving lower individual gain. And if we get to a point where a lot more animals are added to a pasture, their individual gain is going to be so low that they're not able to have enough production to cover their own cost of production. And so net returns will eventually plummet. So at a moderate stocking rate, close to this take half and leave half concept, That's the point at which, on an individual animal basis, uh, production is efficient, as well as on a pasture per acre basis, where production is increasing at an efficient rate. It's up to that grazing manager to determine where those diminishing returns begin, stock up to but not beyond that point. That's correct. The third in this latest article that you cite, Keith, If it's not grass, it's a weed. (laughs) You've heard that time and again. This one earns a different distinction, you say. 
Well, this one I gave a thumbs down because animal consumption and animal preference data from experiments, they both show that cattle don't just utilize grass, but up to 20 or 25 percent of their diet selection can actually be broadleaves or forbs. And these forbs are important because they add a high-quality component to their diet. So just because a plant is not a grass does not mean that it's uh, not important to the animal's um, health and to the nutritional status of their diet. There's one class of plant out there, legumes, that are in our native rangelands that are especially important because they are high in protein. They add a significant amount of protein to the animal diet. And they're also able to capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. And over time, that nitrogen then gets uh, into the soil and it adds fertility to the soil and also helps to maintain productivity of that soil and to help improve and increase production over time. So those legumes are, are very important. Along with that, there's another plant that's very common out in western Kansas another forb, and that's western ragweed. And folks tend to have a very negative view of western ragweed. But in some studies out here at Hayes, there was a 20-year grazing experiment where they showed that actually 49% of the western ragweed forage produced during the year was consumed by grazing animals. Hmm. So almost half of the western ragweed produced is actually consumed during the year. That was the average of this 20-year grazing study. So we may see western ragweed as a problem in general just because it looks like it's so abundant in many pastures, but it actually is utilized to some extent. Something to think about there, although there are, to note here, weeds that one does want to control, noxious weeds in particular. <laughs> yeah, noxious weeds, you know, they they do need to be controlled, and they will, over over time, will reduce grass production in a pasture just because those noxious weeds are often so invasive that they will take over an area and reduce reduce grass growth over time. The same is true with western ragweed. There is a point where western ragweed can be so abundant that it does start to depress grass production. In a couple different studies out here at Hayes, uh, basically it was found that when, when ragweed production gets to the point where it's 35 to 40 percent of the total production, then it will start to de- depress grass growth. But in a healthy system, ragweed production usually isn't going to be more than 5 to 10 percent. So you share all of this, Keith, with the notion that producers, before we get headlong into the grazing season, just a few months away now, they can think about how they're going to allocate their grass resources. And these are some principles they might want to incorporate into their planning. Yeah, these are all things that they they should think about when they're planning and when they're going to start stocking for the year. There's some other rules of thumb as well that I'll probably be talking about in some future newsletters, and there's some other things for producers to consider over time. As a matter of fact, we'll invite you back when you post those in the KSU Beef Tips newsletter, share some more of these rules of thumb and your thoughts on whether they are with any merit or not. Keith, we appreciate the input on all of this important information. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you for having me. Rangeland scientist at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, that's Keith Harmony. If you'd like to read full write-ups on all of these rules of thumb and why Keith rated them thumbs up or thumbs down, you can see these in the Beef Tips newsletter that is found at ksubeef.org. That's ksubeef.org. And you're tuned to Agriculture Today, now these moments away. We'll return then with more here on the K-State Radio Network. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Welcome back. 
Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTN. A last-minute continuance on Friday put on hold the most recent court case against Bayer, claiming its Roundup herbicide causes cancer. According to news reports and a Bayer statement, both sides agreed to the continuance as parties discuss a potential settlement. The case was near completion and about to be turned over to the jury to decide whether glyphosate, and specifically Roundup, led to the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma suffered by the three plaintiffs. This is the first multi plaintiff of case and the fourth uh, case to reach the courtroom around the alleged carcinogenic potential of the widely used herbicide. Bayer had lost all of the three previous cases. Now, the company acquired Roundup Brands as part of its $63 billion purchase of Monsanto. Bayer has continued to maintain glyphosate safety, regularly pointing out that the Environmental Protection Agency and many other country regulatory agencies support glyphosate's continued use. Now, estimates of the number of potential plaintiffs in the U.S. are from 50,000 to 75,000. Media reports have put a possible overall settlement cost in the range of 8 to $12 billion. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's Risk Management Agency is reminding new producers who received a prevented planting top-up payment last fall that you're required to purchase federal crop insurance for the next two crop years. The deadlines to purchase these crop insurance policies, January 31st, February 15th, February 28th, and March 15th, depending on a producer's policy. Now, those who have trouble making their premium payments should be contacting their crop insurance agent to set Set up a written payment agreement to avoid being made ineligible to purchase crop insurance and having to pay back that top-up payment. Producers who had a payable prevented planting indemnity related to flooding, excess moisture, or causes other than drought last year automatically received the top-up payment from their approved insurance providers in the fall of last year. As of January the 20th, the RMA has paid roughly $4.2 billion in claims related to prevented planting for the 19th crop year. Four billion of those total prevented planting claims were associated with floods and excess moisture causes of loss. The RMA also reminds you producers to pay the crop insurance premium by January the 31st. To help those affected by extreme weather last year, the USDA deferred the accrual of interest for 19 crop year insurance premiums from September 30th of last year to this January the 31st, this Friday. For producers who fail to meet that deadline, interest calculated from the date of the first premium billing notice would attach as of February the 1st. If you have questions on all this, obviously, contact your crop insurance agent for more clarification. And a USDA conference urges establishment of a collaborative national network of important soil data. Here's more from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. A conference at USDA brought together soil scientists from around the country. The main issue, building a national network of soil data. The soil moisture network impacts not just agriculture, but communities. And so NOAA has a part, and NASA has a part, and and USGS has data, or wants data, and NRCS has some technical expertise. That was Mary Podall with the National Resources Conservation Service. So individually, there's no one home or house for for the network and all the data that we could capture and analyze and put out as information. David Hoover is the director of NRCS's Soil Survey Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. The goal is not to have separate systems, but for us all to be able to pull our data together and everybody benefit from it. Not just Oklahoma benefit from Oklahoma data, but benefit from all Great Plains data or any other part of the country. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. On the calendar, that series of K-State Winter Ranch Management Seminars gets going later this week at two locations in southwest Kansas, and it's not too late to sign up for those, but you need to do so as soon as possible. These programs will cover a variety of important topics to you, CalCap producers, value captured from improved production practices, what the sale data says, forage sampling and testing, proper vaccine storage and handling, understanding pregnancy loss, and 
and the all-important town hall question and answer sessions at each of these seminars. There will be two taking place this Thursday, the 30th, in Ulysses of the morning, and in the afternoon, the program will run at Ashland. That'll start about 5.30 that evening, as a matter of fact. The others in Plainville and Mankato, February the 11th, Yates Center, February the 27th. But if you'd like to attend these, you need to register in advance, and certainly quickly so. With the Ulysses and Ashland programs in mind, you can find out more information at ksubeef.org. That's ksubeef.org. On we go now to this week's edition of Tree Tales. Here's K-State Forester Ryan Armbrust. Ryan? In many parts of Kansas, we've seen icy roads and dangerous driving conditions several times this winter. Ice buildup is a part of life for us, and we know how to prepare our roads, but thinking about ice buildup on our trees should be part of the plan as well. Just a half an inch of ice can increase the weight of branches by as much as 30 times, but even less ice than that can lead to branch failure, especially on trees with poor structure. In general, a narrow branch angle, less than 45 degrees, is a weaker branch attachment than a 45 to 90 degree attachment. For some trees prone to narrow angles, such as columnar oaks, red maples, and calorie pears, this can lead to sadly predictable failures under a heavy snow or ice load. For many of these trees, Corrective structural pruning, done on a regular basis from the time the tree is young, can significantly increase the chances of your favorite trees surviving the next ice storm with their canopy intact, ready to provide shade and beauty for years to come. For some trees, such as calorie pear, silver maple, willows, and lindens, all with narrow branching, only so much can be done, and it would be wise to consider better options. Burr oaks, Hickories, walnuts, and Kentucky coffee trees are all widely considered to have excellent branch angles and strong wood, and also have the benefit of being attractive, long-lived tree species in most of Kansas. Specific guidance and information about making good pruning decisions is available from the Kansas Forest Service and from your local K-State Extension horticulture agents. And for larger pruning and tree maintenance, we recommend hiring a certified arborist when possible. The old saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is certainly appropriate when it comes to protecting your trees from severe ice damage, especially when you consider how much irreversible damage a few pounds of ice can cause. This is Ryan Armbrust, Forest Health and Conservation Forester with the Kansas Forest Service, and this has been another Tree Tale. Thanks, Ryan. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas 4-H has developed a new program that focuses on initiating community conversations. The goal is to offer youth and adult volunteers training to teach others about ways to approach difficult issues, have tough conversations, and search for common ground. Kansas 4-H culture and communication skills specialist Alaya Mestrovich C. says that the principles of the program will be used during Citizenship in Action February 16th and 17th at the state capitol in Topeka. Alaya, the annual Citizenship in Action is coming up in February, and this seems like it's already an expanded program and a lot of changes this year. Yes, we have been piloting community conversations since the fall, and this is an opportunity for youth and adults to learn about civic discourse and and just practicing civility when they are sharing ideas with each other. And we are expanding this to include Citizenship in Action this year. As part of this, you're writing a bill, you're going to propose that bill, and then there'll be a vote on the bill. Walk us through the whole process, because as you were saying, it starts with a civil conversation. That's right. So the structure will remain very similar in terms of bill writing, discussing this on the House and Senate floors, voting on the bill. But we're going to start by actually exploring public deliberation and public narrative. So 
the youth and adults will get together and talk about three different issues that are facing society today. And the goal is to deliberate, actively listen, explore communication style differences, and find common ground. And so before writing the bill, we're really going to have to deeply listen to each other and find out how we can find common ground for the common good of society. The Community Conversations has been going on for a while, and this is kind of an offshoot of that when we start talking more along the civic discourse line. Yes. So we've gotten a lot of good feedback from Community Conversations. We've been able to pilot how can we prevent mass shootings in our society and also public mental health in America, how can we address a growing problem? And it looks like people are really yearning to find ways to talk to each other in a civil way and still have a tough conversation despite our differences. And youth and 4-H youth in particular are being trained in how to present this in their communities? Yes. So we already have trained over 35 facilitators of deliberative forums or, or civic discourse. And for Citizenship in Action, we will have between 25 and 30 trained youth facilitators to help facilitate these small groups and these forums. 4-H and Kansas State University, I think, have both partnered to do some of this same training with legislators as well? Yes. Just recently, all of the legislators got together in Topeka and worked with a couple different entities, one out of KU and also the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy, to practice civility and public deliberation. And so while we are practicing this in 4-H, the legislators are also practicing some very similar things, which is quite exciting. This all falls under kind of the leadership aspect of 4-H. So why is this important and, and why the movement in this direction? Well, when I think about leadership and communication, it's hard to separate the two because in order to be a good leader, we have to know how to communicate and to accept and explore difference. And right now in our country, adults, we're not doing a really great job just being able to listen to one another. And so I think youth know that and they want to make a difference and maybe one up us, I guess, <laughs> because they're doing it. In these, in these pilots, I am seeing youth from different backgrounds with different beliefs and values come together and believe that speaking with civility is a better way to approach the differences that we have and find the common good, which is better than holding tight to any agenda we have. And how will this play into citizenship in action then? I think there's more than 200 people signed up to participate in this, both youth and adults. How does the whole program work? I think it's a two-day event. Yes. So we will be practicing deliberation and finding common ground and writing those bills on a Sunday. And then that evening, we will be sharing that process on the House and Senate floors and actually looking at how deliberative forums can transform societies as we practice civility. It's such a powerful thing to commit to being civil to one another. And then the youth will vote. They will vote on the bill and see if that's something that they really want to enact and pass or not, just like we do every year. I think you told me that you're moving from what was known more as a debate model to a deliberation and public narrative model with a focus on civility then? That is correct. So in the past, we've historically had more of a, a debate structure for citizenship and action. And this time, it will not be a debate model, but it will be one of deliberative forum and public narrative. So we'll be sharing stories with each other, getting to know each other, actively listening to one another, and really focusing on the issues. But hearing all voices and keeping those in mind as we're moving forward. And the main focus will be civility and finding common ground. And these will be youth from all across the state? Yes. We have over 250 people coming from all across the state of Kansas. What will they take from this? How, how does this help them, I guess, in terms of not only what they learn through 4-H, but outside of 4-H? Well, I think that in all, it will be a way for them to learn how to have tough conversations that matter, to not be afraid to have differing opinions and still be able to connect with people. And I think just interpersonally, they will be able to grow by leaps and bounds. I know I have as I've, I've learned this process and I am now a, a trained facilitator as well. It just really makes you think outside of the box 
and practice leadership in a new way. Does this also help them to learn how to frame their position? Because sometimes things get out of hand. A lot of times that's because people are trying to say something, but they don't know how to say it. Yes. So a lot of the youth facilitators start with just learning about empathy and active listening and how to appreciate communication style differences. And so they go into this experience really thinking about, you know, neutrality and how they can facilitate a group setting and a group deliberation. So if you're a participant, you're learning about civility in a certain way, to share your opinions in a civil manner. If you're a facilitator, you're learning how to bring to the surface everyone's voice and practice neutrality. So there's a lot of skills that are coming out of this. I mean, I'm sure we don't even know all of them yet because we're still in the pilot phase, but people have really caught on to this and really like this. And apparently that's one of the things that's, that's missing right now. That's Kansas 4-H Culture and Communication Skills Specialist, Aliyah Mestrovich C. To learn more about 4-H and community conversations, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.